Well, a, a, a while back, we were in the book of Zechariah. Do you remember that? And um, we've taken a couple weeks away from that, but we want to jump back in again. And we're going to do a little review. Uh, remember we said that the Zechariah was broken up into you know, several parts in the Old Testament. We said that Zechariah was like the revelation of the Old Testament. It's the, it's the prophetic, it's the apocalyptic book, along with books like Daniel and some of the other prophets. But Zechariah lays out God's plan for his nation Israel in, in the times he was living and in times yet to come. Zechariah looked at things in, in the time that he was alive, but yet God showed him things that looked way, way beyond the time that we're living right now. Because we know that all things have not yet been fulfilled. We know that Jesus Christ is coming back to this earth. And the further we go in Zechariah, he really deals with that. Okay, but we want to jump in uh, in chapter 3, and we kind of left off there. Uh, what we call the cleansing of the remnant. And we're going to re revisit that vision. From, from uh, chapter 118 through chapter 5, there are, there are eight visions that God gave to Zechariah. Before the doctrinal and the prophetic part, God gave Zechariah some visions. And these visions all have a significance to the people of Zechariah's time and to our time too. Zechariah prophesied about 400 years before Christ. He was a prophet to the returning exiles remember the Jews, the, uh, the Jews were sent into exile in Babylon. And they, after 70 years of exile, they returned. And if you read Nehemiah and Ezra, uh, they rebuilt the city. They rebuilt the wall. And they began to rebuild the temple. They started, they laid the foundation, and they stopped. That's why the prophet Haggai, that we read just a while back, encouraged them to continue what they, what they started, to finish what they started. When Zechariah came on the scene, the temple had been rebuilt and things had been restored, but not to what they were originally. You know, the temple that Solomon built was a mighty, massive temple covered with gold and silver and bronze. And, and the temple that they built the second time, when they came back, was nothing, as far as size-wise, was nothing in comparison. But God told them, he said, listen, he said, I'm going to bless this temple, even though it doesn't look as great as Solomon's did. Solomon's was destroyed by the Babylonians. But they rebuilt the temple. They were restoring once again their city. And God gave visions to Zechariah concerning the nation Israel and the remnant. Okay? Now, just a little uh, review. If you remember the first vision back in chapter 1 and verse 7, uh, there was a man on a red horse among the myrtle trees and we had said that it seemed like, it was the vision that Zechariah had, it seemed like everything in the world was going well. And, and we, he talked about the nations of the world that dealt with Israel, the secular nations. And, and we remember we said there were four nations. Remember what they were? Babylon, and then the Medo-Persian Empire, then the Grecian Empire, and finally the Roman Empire. Now there were other empires in the world, but those were the four that dealt directly with the nation of Israel, God's people, okay? Uh, we know that there's going to come a time when the world's going to say peace and safety, then will come sudden destruction. And that first vision really looked to that, uh, that thing. In the second vision, chapter 1, verses 18 to 21, there were four horns and four carpenters. Again, the four horns represented the world powers, and the carpenters represented the judgments that would be sent on those nations. Now, we know that the nation of Babylon... Was, was defeated. They were judged. The Medo-Persian Empire went into, you know, they fell apart uh, at the hands of Alexander the Great. The Grecian Empire fell. The Roman Empire, while it fell uh, three or four hundred years after Christ, really remnants of the Roman Empire are still here. And that's a, that's another, that's a whole other topic. Uh, the third vision in chapter 2 uh, deals with the restoration of Jerusalem. And uh, we talked about that. And he, where, that's where God calls Israel the apple of his eye. And it says that all the nations will go and worship in Jerusalem. Now that, that has not happened in history. There has never been a time in history where all the nations went to Jerusalem to worship. But the time is coming 
when all nations will go to Jerusalem to worship the king, Jesus. After Jesus returns and he establishes his kingdom, his throne, he'll be sitting on the throne of David in Jerusalem. All the nations that remain at that time, this will be after the seven-year tribulation period, after Armageddon, after all the, the great tribulation. The nations and the people that remain, there will be Gentile nations that remain after that. They'll all come and worship Jesus at his feet in Jerusalem. Won't that be something? To see if, if, I don't know if the United States is going to be around them, but if, if it is, the President of the United States will go, and he won't kiss the Pope's ring, but he'll worship at the feet of Jesus. I mean, that time is coming, okay? Now that brings us to chapter 3, and this is where we want to kind of start again in earnest tonight. The fourth vision that begins in chapter 3 of Zechariah, and if you have your Bibles, turn with me. And let's read it again. We read it before, but we, we'll just jump in here. Zechariah said, and he showed me Joshua, the high priest. Now, l let me again just remind you that at this time, there were two leaders in Israel. This, the remnant had come back. This was about 400 years before Christ. There was Joshua, who was the high priest, and there was a guy named Zerubbabel, who was like the governor. So there was the secular authority and the, and the, uh, the ecclesiastical authority, the religious authority. Joshua was the high priest at that time. It says, He showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. Now remember we said when we were looking at this, we really made application of this vision to, to us as individuals because if you, listen, if you're going to stand before God, if you're going to try to do something for God, I guarantee you that Satan is going to be there to resist you. And he's going to do anything he's, he can. He'll send people in. He'll send stuff. I mean, he'll do anything he can to resist the work of God. So here's Joshua, the high priest. And he's standing before the angel of the Lord. And Satan is standing there. And what do we say? Satan is called the accuser of the brethren. He's standing there just like in a court. He's like the prosecuting attorney. And the Lord said unto Satan, in verse 2, The Lord rebuked thee, O Satan, even the Lord that has chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? You know, Satan got this idea that he can thwart God's plan. If God chose Jerusalem, how is Satan going to destroy Jerusalem? He went to, he's tried to many times. He's trying to right now. He's trying to wipe out the nation of Israel right now because it's through Israel that the promise will come. And God says, how can you... How can you dare? Here's Joshua, who I've chosen to be a high priest, like a, a, a brand plucked out of the fire. You know, if you, if you think about that, you ever see somebody when they brand a cow and that brand comes out and it's glowing and it's burning? Now it says, now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spoke unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. Now again, when we read this the last time, we talked and we thank God about what he did to us. He took the filthy garments off of us and gave, me a, gave us a, a, he clothed us in the righteousness of Christ. And thank God for that, that hope that we have that, you know, we couldn't, it, it, it didn't say that he told Joshua to take his clothes off and take it back. They did it for him. God did it for him. Now, that's a, a, we, we had that personal application the last time we looked at it. But tonight, I want to focus on the nation of Israel. Because here, Joshua and Zerubbabel, when we read about them, they're representing the remnant of Israel. If you follow the history of the nation of Israel in the Old Testament, we know that they, they never went a couple, you know, a hundred years without offending God. When they, when they came into the promised land under the leadership of Joshua, they went and they defeated all their enemies and so forth, and God told them what to do, and we know that after Joshua died, they forgot everything God told them. They forgot. 
and their history from that point to the Babylonian captivity is that they would continually fall into idolatry. They would continually build altars like we talked about Sunday morning. They would continually build altars to these other gods and worship these other gods in, in the temple. And they would defile God's temple. And God would send prophets to warn them over and over and over again. But they kept and they would listen for a little while. They'd get a good king who'd be there for a little while and he'd get them straightened out. Then he would die and they'd have a bad king. And, and it just kept going on and on. And you would think, you know, if I were God, I would have dumped them a long time ago. If I were God, I would have sent them packing and just started all over again. But you know what? If God makes a promise, he's going to keep his promise. Even in spite of us. There's going to be a remnant in Israel. After all they've done, after all the 2,000 years since uh, the cross where people tried to wipe them out and gas them and burn them and throw them in ghettos and uh, in, in the Inquisition and all that other stuff, there's going to be a remnant of Jewish believers. And it's represented right here. God is going to take the filthy garments off of them. You know, Israel is a nation right now, but they're not a nation in belief. Everybody talks about Israel. Thank God for the nation of Israel. Had its birthday in 1948 when it, when it was uh, reborn, really, after World War II. But they've never been there in belief. They haven't believed that Jesus is their Messiah. They're not worshiping Jesus. They're still in another kind of idolatry. We're going to see in a little bit. Uh, but for all those years, God allowed them. And he finally delivered them into captivity. He put up with them for all those years. But he made a promise that there's going to be a remnant. And just like he did with Joshua, he said, Take away the filthy garments, and unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. And I said, Let them set a fair mitre upon his head. So they set a fair mitre upon his head, and clothed him with garments, and the angel of the Lord stood by. And the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways, and if you will keep my charge, then you shall also judge my house, and shall keep also my courts, and I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch." My servant, the branch, is none other than Jesus Christ, who's going to, when he returns, he's going to restore Israel to the place that God had originally intended for them, the nation of Israel. When people go up to Jerusalem to worship the Lord, they will be going to Israel. It will always be Israel. It, 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 the, the, the Jerusalem will always be Jerusalem. It will always be the place that God had intended for it to be. We see the cleansing of the remnant. Read on, on a little bit more. For behold, the Lord says, The stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, says the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, shall you call every man his neighbor under the vine and under the fig tree. In that day, if you, when we get to the end of Zechariah, we're going to read about when Jesus comes back and sets his feet on the Mount of Olives, and there'll be a great earthquake, and he'll devour all the armies of all the nations of the world, with, just with his word. And in one day, God is going to restore Israel to where he initially, initially meant them to be. A believing nation. I shall be your God, and you shall be my people. Now, God operates through the body of Christ, the church. We're the ones that God uses to speak to a lost and dying world. But then Israel will once again, that's what God originally meant for Israel to be. He meant them to be his ambassadors on this planet. And he didn't do a good job of it. But the time will come. If you read Jeremiah chapter 30, 31, 32, 33, the time will come where God will write his law on their hearts and they will once again be his people. The restoration of the nation of Israel. It brings us to chapter 4, the fifth vision. And let's read. And the angel that talked with me came again and, walked, and, and waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep. And said unto me, What do you see? 
And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick, all of gold, with a bowl upon the top of it, and his seven lamps thereon, the seven pipes to the seven lamps, which are upon the top thereof. And two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl, and the other upon the left side. Now again, these things have significance for Zachariah's time, and they have significance for a future time. Actually, for the present and for a future time. Because he's talking about olive trees and a lampstand. Now, when we think of the lampstand, what do we think? If you, if you go back and you read about the temple or the tabernacle, one of the pieces of furniture in that tabernacle was a lampstand. And you, they would put oil, it burned continually. There was, it lit the inside of the holy place. Now, we know that typically in the Bible, when we talk about oil, that's representative of what? The Holy Spirit. So he saw this lampstand. And the angel talked with me, he said in verse 5, answered and said to me, do you know what these be? And I said, no, my Lord, I don't know what, those, what these are. Then he answered and spoke unto me in verse 6, saying, this is of the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, and we sing it, we quote it, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. You know, the restoration of the nation of Israel is not going to be accomplished by nuclear weapons. It's not going to be accomplished by their, their might or their, their military might or their weapons, their, their tanks and their jets and, and their army. That's not going to do it. The only thing that will establish God's plan on this earth is the working of the Holy Spirit. Just like the only thing that could save us. We can't get saved by reading books. We can't get saved by going to seminars or going to... The only thing that could save us is the Holy Spirit working inside of us, drawing us to the Lord. It's the Spirit that quickens God's Word to our heart and anoints His Word and brings it to us and quickens it to us and gives us life. It's not by power, nor by might, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. It says in verse 7, Who art thou, O mountain, before Zerubbabel? Again, remember, Zerubbabel was the civil ruler, was the governor of that, of that town, of Jerusalem. He says, who art, uh, o great, uh, who art thou, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? In verse 7, Thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof, with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. Who, what is the mountain? Uh, you know, the terrorists, uh, the, the, the Palestinians, uh, Hamas, uh, all these other groups that are trying to destroy Israel. Is any of them too big for God? And again, we'll try to put, make that thing personal. Is anything too big for your God? What you're dealing with, what you're wrestling with, what you're facing, with, with the impossible situation, is it too big? Is it, is it too big that God can't handle? He says, verse 8, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hand shall also finish it. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. For who has despised the day of small things? You see, when they were building that temple, that second temple, it was nothing compared to the first. In fact, in one of the other prophets, it said, some of the old men that remembered the first temple, they wept. Because the second temple wasn't anything like the first. But some of the young men that saw the new temple, they wept too for joy. I guess this all depends on your perspective. See, I'd, I'd, I'd rather see a small group of people filled with the Spirit than 10,000 of them on their way to hell. You know, I'd rather stand before a small group of people that are seeking, seeking God and rebuilding the altar and seeking the Holy Spirit and, and asking God to do things in their lives and crying out to the Lord than, than stand before 10,000 that are, you know, doing the 12 step. Or the two-step, or the five-step, or whatever. Okay. All right. He says, verse 10, For who has despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel, the plumb bob that you used to build things, with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro through the whole earth. See, God is, listen, the Spirit of God is at work in the earth. It was at work in His time. Even though some of the people would have looked around and said, this is not nothing like Jerusalem used to be. 
God knew what was to come. And just like we can look around in our lives, and some of us have been through some pretty hard battles, and we can look around and say, man, this ain't nothing like... The Spirit of God is moving in your life. You've got to know that the Spirit of God is at work. And, and you know what the enemy, just like Satan will stand, stood beside Joshua, Satan will stand beside you and try to convince you that, that nothing is working, nothing is going right. God has forgotten you. You would never say God left, God's mad at you. God, he'll tell you everything to make you think that God doesn't care. But the Spirit of God, you've got to put it in your heart. The Spirit of God is working in your life one way or the other. Now look what he says. Verse 11. Zechariah said, Who are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon his left side thereof? And I answered again and said unto him, what be these two olive branches that, which through the, the two uh, golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And he said, No, my Lord. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Now in Zechariah, in the context of his time, he was talking about Joshua and Zerubbabel because they were the two anointed leaders of Israel at that time. They were the ones who were orchestrating the restoration of the remnant. But if you read this vision in this chapter, you read about a candlestick, and you read about two witnesses. Where else do we read about that? In the Revelation. When John first got the vision of the Revelation, what did he see? He saw seven candlesticks. And it says in Revelation, those seven candlesticks represented the churches. The presence of God on the earth. The presence of a Holy Spirit filled people on the earth. It, in Zechariah's time, it was the nation of Israel. They were God's Spirit led people. In the time that we're living in today, it's the body of Christ. The seven churches, Ephesus, Tyra, uh, Smyrna, Philadelphia, Thyatira, Pergamos, Laodicea. Thank you. I think I've got them all. Ephesus, thank you. They, and they represent the church age, the time we're living in right now. The seven golden candlesticks are here. The two witnesses that he's talking about, you read about two witnesses in the book of Revelation, don't you? Two witnesses representing the law and the prophets. Some people say they're Moses and Enoch. Some people say they're uh, Moses and Elijah or Elijah and Enoch. However you want to, you, know, you can guess. It doesn't tell us who they are. I'm not going to try to guess who they are. But they represent the law and the prophets. They represent God's word on the face of the earth. And during that time, for, for the first three and a half years of the tribulation period, the Antichrist isn't going to be able to touch those two witnesses. But after three and a half years, what's going to happen? They're going to be killed. And the whole earth is going to have a big party for three days until all of a sudden they're going to come back to life. God's witness, this is all about God's witness on the earth. God's remnant, God's people, God speaking to the rest of the world, of the unbelieving world. Through the nation of Israel, through the church, through his witnesses, God always has a witness. He'll always have a witness. He'll always have a remnant. There was always a remnant in Israel. There's a remnant in the church. He always has a remnant. And this is what Zechariah is seeing. Okay. The sixth vision. Now, to this point, the visions that Zechariah is having deal with the glorious restoration of Israel. God's promise that Israel will be his people and he will be their God. Okay. Now things change a little bit. Now the scene changes a little bit. In chapter 5, it says this. Excuse me. Then I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked and behold a flying roll. Now this flying roll wasn't like an eclair flying through the sky. It wasn't a cinnamon roll, okay. It was, it was a scroll. It was a book. And he said unto me, What seest thou? 
And I answered, I see a flying roll, the length thereof is 20 cubits, and the breadth thereof 10 cubits. Then said he unto me, this is the curse that goes forth over the face of the whole earth. For every one that steals shall be cut off as on uh, uh, this side according to it, and every one that swears shall be cut off as on that side according to it. Now, Zechariah is beginning to see things that are going to be happening to the Gentile nations of his time and of our time. There's a curse upon the nations that turn against Israel. You know that the, the, uh, when Jesus, at the very end of what they call the Olivet Discourse, Jesus talked about uh, there would be those who, uh, I'll say unto them, you've given me a drink of water. I can't remember exactly the way it is, but you know, you know what I'm speaking of. Uh, when I was in prison, you visited me, and, you, and, and when I was thirsty, you gave me to drink, and so forth. And I'll say unto you, come, enter into my king. The sheep and goat judgments. And there will be those who will say, I, you, know, you, you, never, uh, you never visited me in prison. You never gave me a drink of water. You never, and I'll say, depart from me into everlasting punishment. Those, those judgments really deal with the nations and how they deal with Israel. When Christ returns, he's going to judge the nations. And those nations that turned their back on Israel, and those people that turned their back on Israel and refused to help Israel, he's going to say, they're the goats. He's going to say, depart into everlasting hell, everlasting punishment. This is what he's seeing. He's seeing the curse that's going out to the Gentile nations who are against Israel. That's why we need to pray that our nation never turns its back on it. We have been. This, is, this administration has been turning its back on Israel. This administration hates the Jews. That's why we're in so much trouble. That's, that's why I don't care. You could go, go ahead and outlaw abortion. That would be great. Go ahead and... Uh, if we go against Israel like we've been, there's a, there's a chick track back there called Somebody Angry with a question mark. If you get a copy of it, read it. Every major disaster that this nation has, has uh, endured in the last 10 or 15 years has Im almost immediately followed something we've done against Israel. And it's been shown to be real. Katrina, 9-11, uh, you name it. Every major disaster has followed something we've done against Israel. He said, verse 4, I will bring it forth, says the Lord of hosts, and it shall enter into the house of the thief and into the house of him that swears falsely by my name, and it shall remain in the midst of his house and shall consume it with the timber thereof and the stones thereof. The curse of God, listen, it's going to, God's going to have his. He's, he's spoken his warning. He sent out his warning and people have stopped their ears. But God's going to have his. Now look at verse 5. It's the seventh vision. And we'll end with this one tonight. Because there's one more in the next chapter and we'll get there next week. Then the angel that talked with me went forth and he said unto me, Lift up now thine eyes, and see what is that goes forth. And I said, What is it? And he said, This is an ephah, which is like a bushel basket. Like an ugly purple basket. Okay, but a big one. This is an, an ephah, or an ephah, that goes forth. And he said, Moreover, this is their resemblance through all the earth. Now this ephah represents, uh, like, business. Okay? Listen. And behold, there was lifted up a talon of lead. And this is a woman that sits in the midst of the ephah. So now, there's in, in this ephah, ephah there, was, there was lead and there was a woman. This is, like, this is a bad dream here, okay? Now listen. Ladies, don't get mad at me. But prophetic visions of women... 
usually represents something evil. Okay? That's the way it is. Okay? Now, I'm not saying women are evil. God loves women. But whenever in, in, in prophetic, what we're seeing right here, we're seeing a picture. The, the ephah is a symbol of business. And the woman is a symbol of idolatry. Idolatry. He goes on and he says, in verse 8, And he said, This is wickedness. And he cast it into the midst of the ephah, and he cast the weight of lead upon the mouth thereof. Then lifted I up mine eyes, and looked, and behold, there came out two women, and the wind was in their wings, for they had wings like the wings of a stork. And they lifted up the ephah between the earth and the heaven. Then said I to the angel that talked with me, where do these bear the ephah? And he said to me, they build a house in the land of what? Shinar. Where, Shinar. Where, does that sound familiar? That's where Babylon was. He says, they build it in the house of the land of Shinar, and it shall be established and set there upon her own base. Now, there, there are a lot of different ways to look at this vision. But I believe that God was showing Zechariah what was going to happen in, in the distant future from him and even in the future to us. Or the time we're living in, really. Because if there's one thing that has marked the nation of Israel, Israelites, the Jews, okay, in the Old Testament they fell into idolatry where they worshipped gods and goddesses and different gods. But then they, after they came back from captivity, they never got into that kind of idolatry again. But let me ask you something, and I'm not anti-Semitic, please. Don't misunderstand me. But what, what, are, what are Jews known for today? Money. Business. The business. You know, when you, when, you, when you go into a, you know, go to buy a car for somebody, you're going to Jew him down, you know. And I'm not saying that facetious. I'm, I love Israel, please. But that's what they're, they're noted for business. And I believe the picture that we're seeing here, and we're going to look at one more place and we're going to close. It's a picture of the Gentile world economy and how the Jews are fitting into it. You know, there's more Jews in New York City than there are in Israel. There are. There are. When we, when we get this picture of the woman in a basket and Babylon and everything, what does that remind you of? If you turn back all the way to the Revelation, In chapter, uh, let's see, Carmen, it's the last one. Okay. Okay. And look at chapter 17. <clears throat> Just going to read a little bit more and we're going to close. Chapter 17 of Revelation, in verse 1. And there came one of the seven angels that had the seven vials and talked with me, saying un unto me, Come here, and I will show you the judgment of the great, what? Whore that sits upon many waters. That's, that's a woman. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. And the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Listen, Babylon was a city that was destroyed many hundreds of years ago. But Babylon still exists. Babylon represents everything that's against God. Everything that's anti-Christ. Business, religion, everything that's against God is represented by Babylon. And while the Jews have not gone into worshipping Baal and Astarte like they did before the captivity, they as a nation have bought in to the world economy He says, verse 3, So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit on a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Do you know that if you see a picture of the European Parliament, Common Market Parliament, look at some of the statues that's in front of that building. The building is, is modeled after the Tower of Babel. We've seen that on a picture before. Okay. And in, in, in the front, there's a woman on a beast. They're not even trying to hide it. 
And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Verse 5. And upon her forehead was the name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Go down to chapter 18. And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a, a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great has fallen. This is future. Some people say, well, Babylon doesn't exist. Yes, it does. Babylon's powerful. It says, Babylon the great has fallen, has fallen, has become the habitation of devils, the hold of every foul spirit, and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Listen, for the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacy. Now, can you read this? When we talk about the world economy tanking, you know, the world marches to the beat of the stock market. When the world trade centers came down, it toppled everything all over the world economically. Just, just, just drop down a little bit. And, uh, well, let's read verse 5. Verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached into heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double according to her works, and the cup which she has filled, filled to her double. How much she has glorified herself and lived deliciously. So much torment and sorrow give her. See, it looks like the world is going strong, and these people with all this money and these entertainers and these porn stars, and oh, they like, look like they're doing great. But listen, they're going to get back double of the misery that they've caused for these rappers and rock stars and everything that lead kids into hell, they're going to pay double. Therefore, in verse 8, shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning, there's that one day again, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament her, for they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment. I, I, I want you to remember those pictures of the towers coming down. They got pictures from far away. And everybody is watching them on their TV and saying, oh. I'm not saying that that was a fulfillment of this. But that was just a glimpse of this. Just imagine when Manhattan goes up in smoke. Somebody say, oh, that'll never happen. So standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour, just one hour, how long did it take for the buildings to come down? And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buys their merchandise anymore. I remember when 9-11 happened, I was at work. I remember I was in the one room, I was running my machine, and somebody came in and said, hey, somebody just flew an airplane into the World Trade Center. I said, ah. Oh. So we all went and were listening on the radio. And, 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 and the other plane came in, and we all got home and watched it on TV. I remember I called home, and I said, hey, Rose, I said, turn the TV on. And she was busy washing clothes or something. I said, no, turn the TV on. The next day, I showed this passage to some of the guys at work. I said, hey, read this. And they were like, because that's what, that's what they saw. But see, that was just a glimpse. That, that, wasn't, that wasn't the fulfillment of this. When this happens, it's going to be, see, they're not going to rebuild after this. There's not going to be nothing to rebuild. The merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn, in verse 11, for no man buys their merchandise anymore. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen, 
purple and silk and scarlet and all the fine wood, fine wood and all manner of vessels of ivory and all manner of vessels of most precious wood and of brass and iron and marble and cinnamon and odors and all this stuff is so important to people. And cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beasts and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves and souls of men. Judgment's coming. Zechariah saw it when he saw the woman in the ephah flying to Babylon and the lead being put in the ephah and bringing it down. He saw the judgment that's going to come on this earth. He saw the judgment that's going to come before Jesus Christ returns. And, and we've, we've been so blinded. It's like, it's like we're brain dead. When I say we, I'm talking about as a people. Thank God for a remnant of people that, that understand what's coming on this earth. A lot of folks are like, you know, you don't want to be gloom and doom. I'm not gloom and doom. I'm just reading what the Word says. Zacharias saw that 400 years before Christ. He looked beyond our time. John saw it about 70 years after Christ was crucified. Why are we blinded as a nation? You try to tell people stuff like this and they'll laugh. And they'll say, you believe that stuff. Yeah, yeah I do believe it. I do believe it. Because it's God's word. And it's going to come to pass. It's going to come to pass. In the meantime, we need to be about our Father's business. We need to be about our Father's business. Amen. We'll pick up next week with the next chapter. Anybody have any questions or comments?